together. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, good to be with you all. Thank you for some of your patience. Um, oh, someone sent a message in the chat. Is Scott doing, Scott is not back to work yet. Scott is still convalescing. Um, he's making huge strides in his mobility, uh, but his fine motor skills um, are, you know, slowly but surely improving. Um, but he's, he is, uh, he's still just in kind of practice and recovery mode right now. Thank you. I was just asking because they were talking about Scott when we were waiting for you. Thanks for the oh, update. Sure. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I've got a, uh, a screen share. I've got a PowerPoint here. PowerPoint. Oh, now I'll ask you guys to mute yourselves. Um, let's see. Slideshow. What's up? Uh, the D guy in the box, in the red box. Okay, so um, this is a little a presentation about some modern contemplatives, particularly Gerald May uh, and Martin Laird, um, two people who um, I've discovered really in the last year and a half as a part of this um, spiritual direction program. Um, and I thought I would share some of um, some of the of what I have learned from them. Um, this is going to be very much kind of just a uh, sort of a highlight, uh, upper level uh, kind of um, survey. Um, oh, so let's first though, um, let's first define what is, uh, what is a contemplative? Um, what are your associations? And you can unmute yourself to answer this. What are, what are your associations with someone who uh, either calls themselves a contemplative or just um, what kind of words or images come to mind? More questions than answers. More questions than answers. Yeah, someone thoughtful. Someone who listens. Someone who listens, yeah. Someone who tries to empty themselves so that God can be fully present. Ah, yes, <laughs> theological answer. Emptying, self-emptying. Someone who can embrace mysticism. Yeah, so this, uh, these other dimensions of reality. Mm -hmm. Deep thought. Deep thought. Yeah, deep thought. These are all, these are all really good. Um, the, uh, you know, I think some common images, this is a Buddhist monk uh, in prayer. Um, this is someone This kind of like hits on that kind of thoughtful, more questions and answers. Um, this is someone practicing maybe trans, uh, transcendental meditation. Um, you know, these I think are pretty common images of contemplatives. Let's look at the, the roots of the word itself. Um, to contemplate, contemplate comes um, from this, uh, the original root is this um, Latin templum. Um, and a templum was a place for observation. So you know, um, even uh, templum is, is actually in Greek, it predates, we're talking a, a, a different kind of temple. The Jewish temple in the Old Testament is primarily a place for sacrifice, uh, primarily a place in which humans come to sort of get right with God through um, animal atonement. Um, in, the, in Greek thought and in Roman thought that a temple was primarily a place where uh, the priest wouldn't sacrifice an animal but the priest would try to have a vision uh, of reality, of ultimate reality, um, including what comes next, um, what, what, the, what uh, the future holds. Um, and so a templum was a place either on land, um, in nature, or a place that was uh, built by humans in which the priest would go uh, and, and observe uh, and, and, and try to um, sort of get in touch with, with what's real. Um, and so uh, we don't actually see the word contemplate until the late 16th century, but it, it dates back um, to, to this uh, concept. So to contemplate or to be a contemplative um, in, in the purest et etymological sense is, and I think in a real sense, is to observe, to be fully present to the sacred temple that is all of reality. Um, so I love this. When you think of contemplate, I love thinking that we're always in the temple. We are always immersed uh, in God, in reality with a capital R, um, that, we don't, th that we don't need special techniques. Um, you don't need special postures. 
Um, you don't have to have special um, sacred texts and, and special sort of liturgical accoutrements. Um, you don't need to be particularly philosophical or intellectual. Uh, to, to contemplate is to observe, to be in the sacred temple that is all of reality. This is a definition from Gerald May, which I really like. Uh, Gerald May is one of the people we're gonna look at more closely uh, a little bit later. Contemplation is trying to face life in a truly undefended and open-handed way. It is a simple and courageous attempt to bear as much as one can of reality just as it is. Um, I think that's really powerful. And I, I would ask you, what, when you think of, what, what, is, what is May referring to when he's talking about, um, when he's talking about reality here, bearing as much as one can of reality, and actually not just what May is talking about, but um, what are we talking about when we're talking about observing what is real? What are the different dimensions um, of, of reality, of, of what is real, the different dimensions of the things that we are trying to be present to and observe? That was like 12 questions at once. Any, any idea, what, what, are you, what are we observing? I would say um, how you feel in the moment is so, one. Yeah, so emotions that are running through us in a particular moment, yeah. I would say the, the world, seeing the world as it is, not as I would like it to be, uh, kind of getting out of my head, emptying all my agenda and my thoughts and so that I can see the world in, in one respect, the way God sees the world. Yeah, so, so really trying to tune into how things are rather than how I would like them to be. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna push back a little bit uh, later on trying the idea of clearing um, our thoughts or clearing our mind, um, because that is, a, I think, a really a common misconception of, of contemplation. It's really impossible mm -hmm. Uh, to clear our minds or to stop all of the streams of thoughts that come, I think the best we can do, awesome, thank you. I think the best we can do is to be fully present to the emotions, uh, to those thoughts, to the even the, the crazy kind of illusions that happen in our brains. Um, other, other things that, that we're observing uh, when we contemplate. But the natural world, you know, the, the physical world that's around us. Human relationship, um, all of these are, um, are really important. So, you know, so, you know, these were the pictures before of, uh, of, you know, maybe these are common conceptions of contemplation, but these, this could just as easily be, um, these could be contexts for contemplation as well. Being with your family, um, being in the midst of a, the, one of the most crowded city streets in the world. Uh, if you are, that, that is the temple. Um, that is uh, a part of uh, sacred reality, uh, observing right in the midst of um, the busiest street in Manhattan. And what, is God, what does God have to do with this idea of um, of observing what's happening uh, in the moment. What does God have to do with, uh, with contemplation? God is all of reality. So God is all of reality, yeah. So God is sort of grounding this reality that we, are, um, that we are trying to observe and trying to be present to. Any, any, what, would other people put it differently or other, other ways that God is involved in contemplation? God is part of uh, creation or uh, the things we are contemplating about. So God is sort of the ground of all that we're, we're contemplating, sort of underneath all of creation. Yeah. And I think I put it like this, an awareness of reality rooted in trust that God is intimately present within us and among us, um, as well as being present within our neighbor um, and all of creation. So um, the reason that we can, the reason that we can safely enter into this temple, uh, the temple of the present moment, um, the sacred temple that is all of reality is that that we can trust that we are already, we ourselves and all of creation is already rooted in God. And, and maybe for Episcopalians, this is not that radical a concept. 
Um, but for many Christian traditions, I think um, there's a sense that I am here and God is out here and I have to do my very best to try to reconcile with God, to try to find God, uh, to try to make peace with God. Um, but but the, this contemplative idea that God um, is suffuses reality um, suff and, and I am a part of reality there's this deep sense of intimacy. There's, this, there's already intimacy with the divine. There's already intimacy with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and this contemplative approach then is, how do, I, how do I open my eyes in this sacred temple to what is already here, rather than um, how, do I, how do I go off and, um, and find a God who is way, way uh, out there? Does that distinction make sense to people? Yeah, it does. So, so let's talk a little bit about. I can't. We don't have a. We don't have time to go through sort of the larger history of uh, the contemplative tradition within Christianity. But um, just a few different examples of Christian contemplatives. Um, the desert. Hold on one second. The desert fathers and mothers. So these are people who and we're going to get to them uh, a little bit more later. But people who um, went out to. Um, they felt like the, the uh, church is becoming really sort of intertwined with the world, um, with political power, uh, with sort of um, wealth in a very dirty way. People wanted to rediscover Christianity um, in its, more, in its more pure form. And so they go out to these, at first they go out to these caves out like in the Syrian desert um, and they, uh, and they pray uh, and they, uh, they believe that you don't have to be in this in these big new Roman basilicas to encounter God. That you could encounter God in a very intimate way in the darkness uh, of of a desert night um, and in one's own cave. Um, we have um, people people quickly realize that it's very difficult to lead that life uh, in a solitary way. Um, so you have the rise of monasteries, um, beginning with St. Benedict and then, um, many, many others, um, in many different forms, uh, continue to, uh, grow and thrive and flourish, uh, and, and sometimes, uh, deteriorate and go through a period of reform, um, all the way through the early middle ages. Um, you know, if we're doing a survey of contemplatives, um, St. Julian of Norwich, um, is really, uh, maybe the founder of, of, um, of a distinctly kind of English uh, contemplative um, perspective. And, you know, I love this quote and this quote talks, it really speaks to exactly what we're talking about. There is a force of love moving through the universe that holds us fast and will never let us go. Now, I mean, this is a very radical thought for, um, you know, 1400 um, in a, in a church that is really, um, is, is putting a heavy emphasis on the ways that sin separates us from God in every moment of every day and the way that sin um, can ultimately separate you from God for all eternity. If you don't um, pray the right prayers and give in the right way, um, Julian comes along and, and gives this radical counter message that, um, that no, separation is not at the core of reality, that um, that love is at the core of reality. Um, just a few more. We're, we're, I'll talk a little bit more about these in a second. But um, Spanish contemplative Spain becomes um, this sort of juggernaut for the contemplative tradition, especially in the 16th century. Um, Oswald has talked about St. Ignatius. Um, Pastor Mary gave a presentation on Ignatian spirituality. Um, St. Ignatius is probably the most well-known of these three. Um, but St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila um, contemporaries, friends, um, are also um, uh, sort of catapult, sort of plumb, plumb some new depths um, of, uh, of the contemplative tradition for Christianity. Um, you know, we're fast forwarding a lot. We went from the, the 15th century, 16th century to Thomas Merton. Um, Thomas Merton, of course, is um, sort of the giant of the 20th century for the contemplative tradition. Um, Thomas Merton uh, could have done probably anything that he wanted, but he felt this call to the priesthood uh, to, and uh, first to monastic life. He enters 
um, a monastery uh, and I, it has a very, very complicated journey, um, but also this journey of transformation over his life. Um, and, and, and really Thomas Merton is one of the first um, sort of large, uh, one of the first contemplatives um, in the Christian tradition to really reach out in a systematic and, and robust way to um, Eastern traditions. Um, and so Thomas Merton is trying to build bridges between the contemplative tradition in Christianity um, with uh, Buddhism uh, and other sort of forms of, uh, of, of Christian contemplation, of contemplation in Taoism and Hinduism, prim primarily in Buddhism. Um, and of course, you probably know Thomas Merton dies tragically. He's quite young. He dies at a conference um, in Bangkok, in Thailand. Um, uh, he has an accident with a, um, a fan in the bathtub um, and he um, is electrocuted. Um, while he's on one of these missions uh, to, to help sort of build, build that bridge. Someone's dog is there. If you could mute your phone. It seems like I've lost my ability to, I, I can't find my super power remote control where I can mute you all. I've got too many things going on. But if you could mute yourself, um, that would be great. Um, and I think probably the most well-known um, contemplative right now, I would say, um, in our current landscape is Richard Rohr. Have, have, have many of you heard of Richard Rohr or read Richard Rohr? Um, mm -hmm. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan. Um, he is based out of New Mexico. He's written many, many books um, and, uh, and has influenced many, many people. Um, you know, I, th I think a little bit about... Um, you know, I think of Richard Rohr, if, if you're, if I'm using like the, um, if I'm using like the metaphor of like 70s rock bands, I think of Richard Rohr as like, like Led Zeppelin, like, like maybe he's the most well known, <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of rock bands in the 70s that are probably less, that are less well known, the band, Leonard Skinner, um, you know, you've got, you've got, you've got a lot of people making music. Um, but sometimes some bands are uh, get a lot more press um, and and for whatever reason sort of take hold in the public imagination um, and I think that's the I think that's what happens with Richard Rohr I think um, he is profound in many many ways um, but there are there are some others out there um, and so that's that's what we're doing that's who we're uh, exploring today one of them is Gerald May um, and one of them is um, Martin Laird um, and I'm just really going to give a, kind of an overview, as I said before, of both of these, um, maybe kind of piquing your interest to go back. I mean, that's, that's really the goal of this is just to give um, you just a, a couple little holds uh, into to who they are and what they've written um, so that you can go back uh, on your own. So first, um, Gerald May. Um, Gerald May is a Midwesterner uh, born in Michigan. Um, he is the half brother of existential psychologist Rollo May. Um, he's raised in the, the Methodist Church. Um, May goes to Vietnam as a conscientious objector and as a medic. Um, and he becomes he comes back and he becomes the chief psychiatrist uh, at the Maryland State Prison System. Um, and he works in that setting for um, for decades. Um, and, and he's in the DC area, um, suburbs of DC, and he begins to meet with a few other people from these different um, traditions, um, a woman from the Roman Catholic Church and an Episcopal priest. Um, and together, they, their, their meetings grow a little bit bigger and they grow a little bit bigger and they discover, this is the 70s, and they discover um, a real um, affinity for taking spiritual belief and spiritual practice and just bringing it to regular people um, outside of monasteries um, uh, and and you have what's what is called the Shalem the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation um, comes to be in Bethesda Maryland and that's where um, I've been studying to become a spiritual director um, so May May's work looms large uh, in uh, in that curriculum in the curriculum uh, of, of my program um, May's got 10 books. We're going to look very briefly at these first three. Um, one of the, they're all good. Um, this one, The Wisdom of Wilderness, which we're not going to get to today, is, um, is a really cool book. If you're, if you're ever looking to sort of 
help articulate why you feel a call to wilderness um, and why you um, maybe sense God's presence in wilderness, um, uh, I recommend that book to you. Uh, but let's go through um, a few of these others. Oh, well, uh, just a little bit more. You know, May does not come out of monasticism. So, you know, these, these so many, I think, in all these different traditions, people in our current context, uh, Richard Rohr in Buddhism, people like Jack Kornfield, um, many of them are, are monks um, or at least pastors or priests. Um, but, but May is not. He's this regular guy. He's got a wife. He's got three children. Um, he's had all this real world experience. He's been in the military. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a real, he offers that as a gift um, in his take on, on the contemplative tradition uh, and practice. Um, I find that he has a lot of humility uh, and accessibility in his writing. He, he will often talk about his own uh, foibles and stumbles. Um, in his book on addiction that we're gonna to get to, I'll, I'll never forget um, reading about how he, how he feels like he's um, addicted to fishing and the ways that, oh my gosh, my dog is here. What, what's going on? Um, the way that he's addicted to fishing and the way that he often doesn't have fun fishing because he's so driven by his compulsions um, to like catch more fish that it, it can oftentimes ruin the experience for him. And I just completely relate to that, um, the ways that, I'm almost sort of like captive to the goal uh, of, of trying to, um, you know, of, of, of what I think has to happen when I go fishing that I can sort of miss out on the beauty uh, of the moment and the beauty of the process. Um, and so I was just so grateful that he admitted that because um, it rings true to my own experience. So we're gonna talk about this just very briefly, these three books. Um, the, this is actually his, the last book that he published. He died of cancer in 2005. Um, but this book is, it's called The Dark Night of the Soul. Um, May is introducing you to these Spanish mystics. Um, he's exploring the work of um, St. John of the Cross uh, and Teresa of Avila in particular. And so, you know, um, if you've ever tried to read the primary sources from um, St. John of the Cross or Teresa, they're a little tough. Um, a lot of Saint, a lot of their, a lot of Saint John's work is in this um, massive poem called *The Dark Night*, um, and so you end up having to read a lot of. Or I had to read a lot of commentary, um, and then Teresa of Avila has this really thick book. Her her work is called *The Interior Castle*, her biggest work. Um, so, you know, I, I I don't think it's cheating sometimes, to, especially if you're not an expert to to go secondhand uh, into some of these really big important thinkers. Um, and this is a book that can help you. Uh, that can help you do that. Um, you know, some of the big breakthroughs um, uh, of, of John and Teresa, um, John coins this um, phrase, the dark night of the soul. And, you know, reading May was the first time I, I felt like I really got, I got, I, I understood a little bit more about what the dark night of the soul is. Um, I think in, in a contemporary context, we think of the dark night of the soul as this um, massive, horrible crisis that comes maybe when someone um, ditches their faith or is about to ditch their faith. Um, but, um, but the dark night of the soul is actually a good thing as given to us um, and defined by St. John of the Cross. Um, our egos like to think that we can see and we can know everything. Um, and this creates, uh, this creates all this kind of, of, of pride um, a quote from May's book, we may yearn to let go and to let God, but it usually doesn't happen until we have exhausted our own efforts. So the dark night of the soul is, is actually in some ways the place where you finally get to when you have exhausted your own efforts at saving yourself, um, saving the world, um, finding enlightenment through your own uh, genius or willpower. Um, it's a place of really profound humility. Um, and, oops, oops. Um, and, and, <clears throat> um, and true spiritual growth is learning to walk with God in faith uh, rather than by sight. Um, being, being content to come to a place where we have less knowledge um, 
less knowledge about the world, less knowledge about ourselves, uh, being content to come to a place where we have less control uh, than we would like. Um, you know, this is a very simple thought, but it's very, very profound and hard for us, I think, to um, internalize. <clears throat> this quote, maybe sometimes in the midst of things going terribly wrong, uh, something is going just right. I mean, have you had that experience in your lives where, um, where you look back and you say, oh my gosh, this thing that I thought was just the most awful thing ever, um, it turned out to be one of the most fruitful things uh, ever in my own life. Um, I mean, that some of us have, have had that experience and, and the, the dark night of the soul would say, yeah, that's the way things are always going. Um, that's not the anomaly, like that's just the way things are, that, that we, we have far less access to all that God is doing with us and through us. We have far less access than we think we do, um, even, uh, even as our egos try to label like, this is good, this is bad, this was high performance, this was low performance, um, this was a good connection, this was not. You know, some of that's important. Some of that ego work is, is it's how we make our way through the world. Um, but, you know, we should temper that with, we don't have God's view. We don't, we don't have that larger perspective. Um, our view is very, very small and narrow and, and limited. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, but it's not um, the way that there are larger forces at work, um, divine forces at work that are, that are bigger than that. So, um, so I recommend that book. Oh, Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So another quote, the darkness of the night implies nothing sinister, only that that liberation takes place in hidden ways beneath our knowledge and understanding. Um, it happens mysteriously in secret beyond uh, our conscious control. Um, and so that's just a question to ponder about, uh, about how much you believe, how much you believe uh, that, that those things uh, can be hidden um, and how much you believe we always can see those things. I'm gonna keep going. Um, Addiction and Grace. So this is, this is um, a book that, that is, um, comes out of May's um, deep experience with addiction as a psychiatrist. Um, so you can only imagine in the Maryland state prison system, um, he's dealing with a lot of people who have had um, substance abuse issues, substance addiction issues. Um, and as May reflects on, um, sort of spirituality um, in connection with that work um, with those inmates and with his you know, training in psychiatry and psychology, he realizes that we all have addictions. We all have attachments. Um, and, and these three kind of places where addictions cluster, this is, these come from May, but they, they show up in other, um, other writers too, other contemplative thinkers, our addiction, our addictions cluster around power, um, you know, controlling our, our own destiny, uh, controlling the people around us, uh, but, but primarily, you know, the control that we wish we had. Uh, our addictions cluster around possessions, uh, income, property, uh, financial security, um, and then relationships. And especially we get addicted to um, approval, uh, affection, we get addicted to um, you know, gaining our self-esteem from, um, from what people think of us uh, and, and the status that other people give us. And what we really, what we really long for, oh, well, and then, um, and you know, one of the interesting things about this book is he goes through and talks about just the same way that like, if you're addicted to, um, if, you're, if you're an alcoholic, your mind is gonna use all kinds of unbelievably sophisticated um, and multi-layered techniques to help, to help you not admit that you're an alcoholic. Uh, and some of us who are in recovery know how this works. Some of us who have had uh, good friends or family members uh, know how, how this works. How, you know, when you're talking to someone who's clearly addicted, you can see it, but they themselves um, have really built mo all this scaffolding through repression, um, through d denial, uh, through rationalization. 
Um, and, and we do the same thing with our own, uh, our own kind of addictions, whether that's, you know, addictions to um, food, addictions to money, uh, addictions to people's self-esteem or, or getting self-esteem from others' opinions, all these areas of power, um, possessions, uh, and human relationships. We have these same things that are at work within us. And, and, and May makes the point that, you know, our, our addictions draw enormous spiritual energy away from, uh, from loving God uh, and from loving another. Um, this idea of a, an attachment, uh, I think attachment, he talks about attachment as uh, being nailed down. I think that's where the French were. I think the French um, has something to do with being nailed to. And so, you know, when we're addicted, we're, we're sort of bound, we're nailed to um, these, these things, these elements in our life. Uh, and I think what so many of us long for is freedom. And we get these little tastes of it. Um, you know, we get, I think we all get these little tastes or sometimes bigger tastes than others uh, of just being able to say, you know, I, you know, if you have an addiction to, let's say, um, people thinking that you are productive enough, you know, you want people to really think that you're, you're a hard worker. Um, you know, maybe in that case, you get this little tiny piece of freedom where you're like, I, I don't really have to, like, I don't have to return that email. Like, maybe they'll think that I'm just like super lazy, but like, I'm free. I'm free. I could, I could return that email or I could not return that email, but I am not gripped in this moment by the compulsion, uh, by that attachment, um, I'm, I'm free. Uh, and so, you know, the gospels talk about freedom. Paul um, uses freedom as a, a really a driving principle of the Christian life of what it, of what it means to be um, baptized into Christ is to be free um, from, is to, is to no longer to be a slave. Um, and so, and ultimately, we want to use that freedom for love. Again, um, those compulsions soak up so much of, uh, of our energy to love. Um, and, and, you know, the book is called Addiction and Grace. Throughout May's work, um, grace is a really, um, uh, grace is a, a huge part of, you know, his divine equation. Um, he, I love this quote, grace is the most powerful force in the universe. It can transcend repression, addiction, every other internal or external power that seeks to oppress the freedom of the human heart. Um, grace is where our hope lies. Um, and, and I think May would, I think May says, and I know May says, we don't, we don't conquer our addictions. Um, and this is, I mean, this is sort of straight out of um, recovery philosophy. The, as soon as you, you know, say, I, I, I have totally made peace with alcohol and I'm free from its hold on me, you know, that's when things get a little dicey. So, you know, we, we don't conquer our addictions, but we learn to trust in God's love for us in the midst uh, of all of those addictions. And there's an, there's an incredible freedom in that. Um, and, and in fact, we can, sometimes we can be so attached to um, like enlightening ourselves, we're so attached to reforming ourselves, um, so attached to uh, becoming this ideal of ourselves that, that we're actually enslaved by that, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, there, there, there can become an enormous freedom in saying, oh my gosh, I'm messed up in all these different ways, but like, that's okay. Like God is still working in me in ways I don't understand. Um, God still loves me. Uh, I'm still an agent of, uh, of good in the world in ways that I probably have no idea about. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to just let go a little bit of having to um, perfect myself. Um, and I think this is a really important message for Lent because, you know, Lent gets just warped to be this like, you know, like you're just going to whip yourself uh, into becoming more Christ-like. Uh, that's kind of the traditional um, picture of Lent. Uh, whereas Lent at its healthiest can just be like, I'm going to let go of it all, including my own project uh, to perfect myself. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to trust in grace.
Any, okay, so I haven't even let you all in at all um, for uh, questions or comments. So uh, <clears throat> before I go any further, any comments or questions about um, either um, Dark Night of the Soul or Addiction and Grace? I wonder whether using this, the term addiction and attachment uh, is useful because to me attachment is a softer word addiction carries pretty bad connotations yeah i prefer to use attachment for something that i am attached to yeah addiction may, maybe makes it feel like it's it brings in sort of the, the connotations that we have with heroin um you know at christ church we have um when we're firing in all cylinders, we have a, a sexual addiction group, uh, Overeaters Anonymous group, um, and then multiple um, alcohol AA meetings. And so when you hear addiction, you know, it's easier to think about maybe those full blown life altering. Um, uh, Father. What's that? Father Seth. Um, yeah. I, I've heard um, former addicts, and it might have even been um, Kristen Johnston in her book, or, or, or I don't know. Um, we all have addictions. The only time that you need the recovery, or you know, where there's societal shame, or or where you need intervention, is when that addiction prevents you from having a normally functioning life. So like you can have a coffee addiction, but it doesn't get in the way of your day-to-day -day life. And so a lot of people I've heard of are reframing the, the, the word addiction um, and kind of leveling it across the playing field um, and kind of trying to destigmatize it. Um, because so long as you can still function healthily, then it you know shouldn't have that kind of tinge to it. Yeah, I, and I think that's that's probably where May is coming from as well. Um, that we that that if we're honest, like if I'm honest, I'm uh, I'm not just attached to coffee. Like I'm addicted to coffee. Like I if I don't have coffee, I hate a massive headache. I'm super grumpy. Um, it's a chemical addiction for sure. Um, but but uh, to your point or to Kristen Johnson's point, it doesn't it actually enhances my life. I think in a lot of ways, I'm more productive uh, with coffee than I, than I am not, than I am without. So I don't need to do a recovery. Um, but, but there are some of the things that I'm addicted to that do drain life energy that do affect my life. They do affect my functioning. Um, but they're, it's, it's a much smaller scale than like a gambling addiction. Uh, in which I'm going to basically gamble away the finances of my family. Um, so yeah, interesting, interesting bits about the word, but I think this general theme um, is let's not scapegoat all those people over there who have the addiction, addiction problems. Let's be willing to say we're all broken in all kinds of ways, and we all have life energy, spiritual energy being drained off um, by these kinds of attachments and addictions. Um, oh, there's another quote I have. Growth in faith means willingness to trust God more and more, and not only in those areas in our lives where we are most successful, but most significantly at those levels where we are most vulnerable, wounded, uh, and weak. Um, and so this goes back to this uh, idea of that when we, and, you know, this is, this is from Christ, this is from Paul, um, you know, when we when you got it all together, you're not you're not you don't really need God that much, um, or you don't feel like you do at least. You're not you're you're doing pretty good on your own. But when you come into contact with those places where you're vulnerable and wounded and weak, um, you you know these are this is where you can grow most profoundly uh, in in trust, um, and not that you sort of have to, you know, you the goal isn't just to kind of like live you know, always out of your own wounds and you're always sort of um, lifting up your own brokenness because you, because all of us have these incredible gifts as well. We're all you know, sanctified by the Holy Spirit who sends us out to do these amazing things. Um, so, you you know, we want both of those as, as a part of the equation. But I think sometimes, um, sometimes 
you know, I think maybe because of shame, we don't, we don't give God enough credit for showing up in those parts of our lives where we're just really, where we're just messed up because we're like, I think some of us secretly think that like, oh my gosh, if, what if God knew how messed up I am in that area? Um, like God must really not like that part of me uh, or God must um, really be hoping that I can just like fix that in a hurry yesterday. Um, we often, I don't think, we don't think of the opposite, which I think is the reality is that like God knows all of the deepest weaknesses and vulnerabilities that we have. And, and God actually meets us uh, in those, as well as in our gifts, in those vulnerable, broken, uh, wounded, weak parts. Um, God shows up there. And God's like, I got you. I'm, I'm here. I'm right here with you in the midst of these things, uh, too. Even though you're ashamed of them, uh, I'm not ashamed of them. All right, so the awakened heart, um, you know, I think May continues, and in, in, I, I think in the intro of this one, he says this was basically like, I'm not going to write anything else. Like, this book says everything I really need to say. Well, I think he goes on and writes at least one more book. Um, but he, he broadens um, the, the themes that he's had throughout some of these other books. He's got a great, a, the, you know, the beginning of The Awakened Heart. Um, he's got this great piece on, on love versus efficiency. And if you're someone who um, is like me, where you're sometimes like so caught up in what you're doing that like your kid comes over and is like, you know, love me. And you're like, I don't want to, I can't love you. Like I got this thing I got to do. Um, read, read May because May will help kind of identify like the ways that we so can some of us can so prioritize um, productivity and uh, kind of personal efficiency over um, human relationship and um, I think he talks about the ways that you know um, human eff efficiency and productivity is the, the how of, of life often but love is the why of life and um, efficiency and productivity should always serve love. Love is the end. Um, efficiency and productivity are not the end. Um, they're, 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 you know, it's how you put food on the table. Um, you know, it's how you, it's how you function in your life, but, but ultimately let's, let's not get those two reversed. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you find yourself or if you, you have people in your life who you feel like this person is so driven and they, they achieve so much, but oftentimes it's at such a high cost, um, you know, think about, think about that book. And then, and then he also has this great piece, uh, again, um, you know, talking a little bit about um, this, this weak, weak and, and wounded parts of us and, and of life. He has this great piece on the myth of fulfillment. I think I have a couple, few quotes here. So he says, we are addicted to fulfillment, to the eradication of all emptiness. We have swallowed the cultural myth that says, if you are well adjusted and if you are living your life properly, you will feel fulfilled, satisfied, content, and serene. <laughs> If you are not satisfied, so then, then the corollary that never gets named is if you are not satisfied and fulfilled, there is something wrong with you. Um, I don't know, do, do other, how, do, how does other, how do people either resonate with this or want to push back against this? Does this make any sense to people? I see some, some muted nodding. I think, um, you know, I think that that there can be almost kind of like shame and stigma if you um, are not always feeling fulfilled and satisfied and content and serene. Um, that that sometimes that th those are not just natural parts of the human condition to be and actually parts to be celebrated. May would say, the myth of fulfillment makes us miss the most beautiful aspect of our human souls, our emptiness, our incompleteness, our radical yearning for love. We were never meant to be completely fulfilled. We were meant to taste it, to long for it, uh, and to grow toward it. Um, and this is, I think this is just so difficult to um, internalize because I think we have such, 
at least I um, can have such high expectations uh, for, um, you know, to like, to, to always feel like enlightened and fulfilled uh, and complete. And I, I hate the way that we as a church and the Christian tradition may even feed into that sometimes. Like if you just uh, are doing X, Y, and Z, um, you know, you, you will just be filled with uh, peace uh, and love and joy all the time. Um, and I think that's what I was talking about naming. And I was thinking about that, that uh, maybe our society, our culture has taught us that uh, this is what's most important. And if you're not this way, there's something wrong with you. And they have defined what is valuable, what is good, what is uh, preferred. And we just maybe think that if we are not that, we are not real to ourselves and that we are incomplete. And, and I think that's the danger of, of, of just trying to get our values from the larger society instead of uh, knowing that we are dependent on God and, and it's God who determines who uh, what, what we need. And uh, as long as we are trying to get closer to God, we feel that emptiness that God, only God can feel. And yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, and May would probably add to that, that um, maybe a, a, a part of our human journey is that we, that sort of God filled whole will never be completely filled yes. by God. We'll always have this um, kind of yearning. Um, so let's just like, let's not be afraid of that yearning. Um, let, let's not sort of be ashamed of that yearning. Uh, let's just, let's be with it. Um, oops. Okay. Um, and then this is, I think the next paragraph, um, in the, in the book, this is a secret known by those who have had the courage to face their own emptiness. The secret to falling in love with life as it is meant to be is to befriend our yearning instead of avoiding it, to live into our longing rather than trying to resolve it, to enter into the spaciousness of our emptiness instead of trying to fill it up. The spaciousness of our emptiness. Um, you know, this is, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is all kind of like, it's a lot of words. Maybe it sounds really abstract. Um, I guess I resonate with this sense of the times in my life when I'm able to just sit honestly with my yearning and longing um, and even, um, yeah, those things that are not fulfilled, there's a deep fulfillment in that. There's a, there's a peace um, in letting go of having to, you know, experience that peace. And there's a paradox there. And, and again, maybe that just sounds kind of wacky. Um, but, you know, do, do other people in terms of like this, this myth of fulfillment or, or do other people relate to this kind of like the, the secret, the secret known to those uh, who've had the courage to face their own emptiness. Does that, does that resonate with folks? I can't. I think it does resonate. And uh, one of the things um, that I don't, I think it was uh, Henry Nouwen. I'm not sure of that, but I think, I think Henry Nouwen uh, prescribed looking at your life, the good things and the bad things, looking back at both the good and the bad and trying to see where God is active in your life. Mm. And that's sort of the, you know, looking back at, the, at, the, at those times which are empty and where you're, you're, you know, you're just striving to find fulfillment and it's very satisfying to recognize, uh, even in the bad times, God was present with you in some in some way. Yeah, that's. I mean, I think that's right. And it, God shows up in the desert, in the wilderness, um, and it is sometimes. I think that's a really important idea. That sometimes it is looking back that we're able to realize that sometimes in the moment, it is hard um, to to find God uh, to make peace with that emptiness. And, and I think that, you know, May says that, but, but May wouldn't want us to give up hope that even like in the course of the day, and I think he says that it takes a, an enormous amount of gentleness with yourself um, 
an enormous amount of sort of patience and gentleness with yourself to go through your day and all of those little frustrations, uh, all of those little things that are you wish were different about yourself or about the world or your life, um, all of that longing and unfulfillment, it, it takes a lot of gentleness and patience to say, all right, God, you're in this too. You know, oh, look, you're in this too. Uh, you're in this as well. Um, and that, that, that's such a, a close um, dwelling uh, is, is possible, uh, even if it's hard. There's a, a new book that um, David Martin has written uh, called Learning to Pray. And it's his contention related to this whole idea that we can never be satisfied ourselves, be fulfilled ourselves, because we want to pray because God is all the more longing for us to pray for that relationship and that connection with God. Yeah, yeah that's really beautiful. I mean, and, and that, that's that idea of grace, that, that the grace is, God's grace is so much more powerful than our own, um, uh, our own small efforts to, uh, to kind of spark uh, the divine ourselves. All right, so now we're gonna transition. Um, I've used up a lot of time um, with, with Gerald May. Um, Father Martin Laird has, has, has actually been a really important um, figure for me. And he's a very different kind of figure. Um, we're back to uh, a priest, we're back to someone ordained, we're back to a monastic. Um, he's a, a Catholic priest in the order of St. Augustine. We're also back to this, someone who is an academic. So he is not someone who is like, you know, down in the psychiatric hallways of a state prison. Um, he's at Villanova. Um, uh, he's a retreat leader and, and, but I, I, he still offers some really, really profound insights, um, about the human mind and, and the intersection between the human mind, uh, and spirituality. And, and I'll show you that I'm going to show you through his three books. I'm not going to go through each of his books in the same way I did with, uh, with, with Gerald May. Um, I think Laird has some, some basic messages that he, sort of circles around over and over again with new language, new examples, um, new metaphors. I think he, he's really gifted um, uh, at metaphor in particular. Um, this is Into the Silent Land, Sunlit Absence, An Ocean of Light. These all came out about maybe five years apart. Um, you know, I people ask me like, where should I start? I, I've been telling people to start with Into the Silent Land. I actually read Sunlit Absence first and I think Sunlit Absence might be my favorite because Into the Silent Land, he gets a little, it's, it's a little technical. I almost think he wrote Sunlit Absence as a way to be like, don't get so caught up in, um, in the technicalities of, of some of this stuff. Um, so I, I now would actually recommend starting with a Sunlit Absence, but you could start anywhere. They, they, don't, they don't necessarily really build on themselves. Uh, as you can see from the you know, from the subtitles. Um, so, so um, he, Laird offers beautiful prose and he, I think he has this particular gift for image and metaphor. So here's just one example. Um, you know, there's this classical theological problem. How, how are we in God, but not God? Um, how does God dwell intimately with us? Um, but, but not, is not necessarily a part of creation, a creature. Um, and so I love this. God encompasses all things, even as God indwells all things. The way the sea fills the membrane of the sponge that makes its home in the sea. The sponge is itself immersed in the vastness that indwells it. Uh, yet God's indwelling saturates us even more pervasively. The sponge does not seek this out. This is just the sponge's life, nor do we seek out God. Um, this, is, this is our life. And um, so I love that. Like the sponge is the sponge is not the ocean. The ocean is not the sponge. They they are different. Um, but that but that the the ocean so kind of interpenetrates the sponge, um, and the and the sponge finds itself in the ocean. It's like everything the sponge knows is uh, is the sea. Um, 
you know, I, I think that's a really simple metaphor for the ways that God kind of interpenetrates us, is all around us, um, but is not us, is different than us. So th that's just one little example. Uh, and I already said that he circles around these things. So a couple, there's a, just, I just want to raise out a couple, raise up a couple parts of Laird's thought that, um, that I think is so important. One of the, one of these is this idea that we're immersed in God, um, even as we don't know it. Um, the, and so we naturally might ask, and I don't know, someone is maybe, I ask you to mute yourself if you've got some background. Yeah, yeah. Screw him up. Huh? Screw him up. Oh, I found my power bar again. I'm muting people. Um, so, um, so May would say, um, what keeps us from knowing our essential? What keeps us from knowing that we are? What keeps what keeps us from knowing that we are immersed in God? And and um, and, and May would say that primarily, um, what keeps us uh, from this is this this the chattering of our own minds. And this is a quote. I don't know that I can read all this because I've got these other things. Um, this quote: this, "This illusion of separation is generated by the mind." and is sustained by the riveting of our attention to the interior soap opera. And so I love these images, the interior soap opera, the constant chatter of the cocktail party going on in our heads. For most of us, this is what normal is. Um, and I actually remember being on a plane, I think I was, I was on a plane going to Shalem and I uh, was reading his book, trying to catch up on some of the stuff I had, was supposed to have read before I went on this uh, intensive. And um, I remember reading this and, and, you know, reading about him talking about like this internal, like talking, talking, talking that we're just always have, we're always just like talking to ourselves. And I just remember being kind of floored by how, um, I don't know how true that sounded to my own experience. Uh, and, and I hadn't read that. I hadn't read, read it articulated in the way that Laird articulates it in another contemplative uh, author. I had read it. I had read it in, um, in my reading in mindfulness. Um, and I really think Laird offers the best synthesis of mindfulness in the Christian tradition. Um, so Laird doesn't, he doesn't really talk about mindfulness. Maybe in his third book, he talks a little bit about um, the concept, but he's not explicitly drawing this link between, um, between the, the pillars or concepts of mindfulness and uh, Christian contemplative tradition, but, but, it's, but it, they're very much there. Um, he does say basically that the desert fathers and mothers 1700 years ago, that, that they had, they really had sort of intuited what modern um, uh, behavioral cognitive therapy would um, come to like 1700 years later. So he, he does say that, that, that these early desert mothers and fathers, they, they basically, they basically had a lot of this stuff um, figured out. He, 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 um, picks out Hezekiah, uh, this guy, Evagorius Ponticus. Um, you know, he's got, he, he shows these letters from some of the, the, big, the big name early desert fathers like uh, Jerome, St. Jerome and, and Basil the Great. And he shows that these people are writing, they, they, like they've, they've each gone to the desert, they've each gone to the cave and they're writing each other and they're saying, Oh my gosh, we've like left behind the parties and all of the glamour of Rome. But like what we haven't left behind are, are the are our heads. Like our heads are still just like totally going a mile a mile a minute, even though there's so much less external stimulation um, internally, these these people are saying 1700 years ago, you know, we're still just totally overstimulated by the thoughts that come up in our own head and and uh it's not just the thoughts or the emotions that come up but it's the stories 
that we then layer on top of, um, of these emotions. It, we, we kind of like have this emotion and then we just like froth it up with all this internal commentary, all the story making. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you might think of this or a lot of different examples. I think of it like, or one example would be like, let's say you're in your car and you're late for an appointment um, and you are, you've got some different like raw emotions there. If you were to really kind of like think about things in this just simple emotional form, maybe you're, um, maybe you're uh, angry um, either at yourself or others that you're late. So you've got this emotion of anger. Um, maybe you're nervous about what that's going to do for your meeting because, you know, you're supposed to be there leading the meeting. Um, you know, maybe you are, I don't know, maybe you're sad um, that this is happening to you, you know, that, that, that you're going to, you're going to miss out on something. So there are these simple emotions, but then for many of us, if, if when we're sitting there in the car, we might layer on top of those emotions of um, anxiety and anger and maybe sadness, this whole story of like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm always late. Like I, I'm, I, I'm never, like I've never been very good at being on time and like, I'm such a screw up. So, you know, these are like this whole story sort of about yourself or maybe the person in front of you isn't going fast enough. And you're like, oh my gosh, old people, like they just drive so slow. Like what, how can that person still have their driver's license? Like, you know, so you're making up all these stories about someone else. Um, you, you, this this kind of like you froth up this whole commentary that that it would be one thing just to say like oh wow look at that like I'm I'm really angry or I'm really um, I'm really nervous I'm feeling nervous but but we never we don't often articulate those simple emotions what we articulate to ourselves is this whole story about who we are how the world works who other people are um, and um, and that's what that's what that that and we can mistake that whole that for our whole life like that that can just be um, who we are and how we move through the world. Um, now here is the this the, here is the most important thing that the desert fathers and, and mothers would have you learn and what Martin Laird wants you to know and, and what I want you to know too. That that when you're dealing with all of this story, the most important thing is that you don't try to stop. Uh, these thoughts. You don't try to stop the story. Um, these these audio and videotapes. So, you know, even before these Desert Fathers knew about video, they would say that we, we, we play in our minds, we play all these things up. Um, and they wouldn't, they didn't know the word video, but they, these images, like we play all this stuff out. And they said, you, you, you can't turn that off. Um, you know, maybe a modern metaphor is like, you know, you can't turn it off. Just like go grab some popcorn and just like, just check it out. Like, just, just see like, what, what is your mind doing? Like not only the emotions, but like, wow, look at that story that, that is like, I'm telling myself about what's happening. And, and this incredible secret that mindfulness knows, but also that, that, that the desert fathers knew is that if you just meet all of that frothy story with silence, if you just notice it, if you just be present to it, it'll pass. It'll pass, it'll pass like weather that um, is so stormy and so intense and feels like you're always gonna be there. But you know, weather just passes, even the biggest thunderstorm just moves off the mountain down into the valley uh, the sun comes out again. And, and so Laird is saying um, that this is so much a part of, um, this is so much a part of making room to, 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 um, to know God, making room to be connected and grounded in God uh, is just simply not getting caught up in the uh, not getting hooked uh, and and spun by all of these stories all the time. To notice them, to watch them, um, but not to give them power 
uh, by, by following them so closely. Um, and then we're almost done. I know I'm over time. Thank you for your patience. You're obviously welcome to go anytime. Um, but but he, what I also really like about Martin Laird is that he's the only contemplative writer that I know of who so explicitly talks about um, depression, anxiety, uh, these afflictive emotions, fear. And he doesn't talk about them in a way that is like, if you just learn centering prayer, those things are all going to go away. Um, he talks about really the reality of those things, even when you are have a long standing relationship to some of these contemplative practices, you might still experience depression, you might still experience anxiety. Um, but, but, the, but the qualities, um, the, the way that you experience those is going to be different, there's going to be more space uh, in there for, for God, um, more space in there for peace and joy, but, but it's not going to just sort of magically take it all away. Um, he, this quote, but gradually we learn something very precious under the tutelage of these wounds. And he's talking about depression and anxiety and some of these afflictive emotions. We learn a compassion for others that replaces judging, self-loathing, the compulsion to find someone to blame. We learn a reverent joy before our wounds that replaces the condemnation of and comparison of ourselves with others. Uh, that is such a primary fuel for our own anxiety. Um, and he even talks about the ways that, and I love this, and I don't know many who talk about it in such depth, because he talks about it in all three of his books. Um, he talks about the ways that, that, you, that, that our wounds actually can become these beautiful reminders of the ways that we need to constantly come back um, to our grounding in God. Very much like, um, like, like Gerald May talking about like tuning into our emptiness, our yearning, our lack of fulfillment, moment to moment throughout the day, that this, this actually uh, can ground us in, uh, in God's, pres God's loving presence. Um, the very things that we are ashamed of and think that we should get rid of, those become like a little, like a bow around the finger that can remind us all day long, oh my gosh, it's okay. Like I'm, I'm in God. Um, Okay, and we—I was going to—and he does talk about centering prayer um, as a as a particular practice. So you know, throughout the day, so there, and and this is like mindfulness talks about formal practice and informal practice. Most contemplatives talk about formal practice and informal practice, but they may use different words. Informal practice is simply what this was what we're talking about. Like throughout the day, practice meeting thoughts without commentary. Um, simply observing them as part of reality. That, that's informal practice. But then um, it really helps to set aside a more formal, concentrated time uh, to watch your mind do all of its crazy stuff, to grab the popcorn uh, and just to sort of like go along for the ride, to see, see what's going on in there. Um, and, and mindfulness would say this is mindfulness meditation. It's, I think it's really cool that centering prayer um, especially grounded in Laird's work is, is quite similar. And, you know, so I have anyone who wants this PowerPoint presentation, just email, I'll send it to you. You know, I, I th these are the, these are the generic um, centering prayer directions from contemplative outreach. Um, Laird has his own, you know, little tweaks. Every contemplative author who uses centering prayer has their little tweaks on, on it. Um, but, you know, this is, this is the method, um, come to the Centering Prayer group on Tuesday afternoons if you want uh, to learn a little bit more and to, to practice with people. Um, but, but very simply, um, choosing a word, sitting with your eyes closed, noticing the thoughts come up because they do, you cannot stop them. Um, just using your word to, to come back, um, to not get hooked into that whole story getting hooked again, um, using your word, coming back over and over. Um, and and it's a transformative process that it's sort of like the dark night of the soul. A lot of it happens underneath uh, your own conscious mind. Um, and then lastly, um, just the last thought about both of these contemplatives. Um, 
you know, sometimes I think sometimes um, the path of contemplation or the, the path of spirituality gets placed um, kind of like in tension with or even um, in contrast to a concern for the world. Um, and I think sometimes the way that can that some people engage in contemplation or um, sometimes the way it's presented, it really is kind of like this holiness trip. It's kind of like get out of the world, um, get into kind of nirvana, get into your own peace. Um, but, but both of these authors would say that the measure of one's spiritual life is love. It's not about becoming holy, feeling more spiritual. It's not about these ecstatic experiences, these altered states of peace. Um, you know, these are really oftentimes driven by, you know, something from our ego. Um, you know, the real, the real measure are, are do, do these things give you energy moment to moment for kindness and compassion and to love other people? Um, that that's, that's the goal. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus gives us, to love God and to love neighbor. Um, and, and as much of, as these ideas and these practices can help free you up uh, for love, um, you know, that, that's, that's what's important. Some people, you know, we've all met people who aren't even Christian, who, who've never heard of contemplation, who, but who, are, um, who, who, who will be there with you in that moment with kindness and compassion. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's, that's the goal. These are sort of tools methods, concepts to help, um, to help with that goal. So any, um, I know we're over time, but any um, parting thoughts or comments or questions that people have? I just wanna... Yeah, the, you know, listening to the, your explanation of, about these people, I get a very strong sense that they are very panentheic. In other words, we are all in God, but we're not part of God. And what contemplation is supposed to do is remove the barrier between you and the totality of God that you live in. And as, as Oswald in his sermon this morning says, you are named and you assume that name, you get that persona. So part of our duty is to get rid of the persona to find the real person how we it how to learn how we are part of this whole thing yes i think that's very well said we we have these these identities that we feel like are our ultimate identity um and I, as all was saying this morning in his sermon that our ultimate identity is that we are immersed in god loved by god um and yeah, how and and sort of taking on practices that really kind of open our eyes uh, to that to that reality that's in us and around us all the time. Yeah. Some, was someone else going to go? I, I was just going to, if I may. Yeah, John. Um, this is really powerful and very very informative, and this is probably a light, uh, rather a lighter statement, but it, a lot of it involves be kind to yourself. I think we sometimes are much too judge, judgmental about ourselves, you know, like I'm always late, which is one of my addictions. And then I get blaming myself instead of being kinder to yourself. And I, I think that's maybe a little superficial, but be kind to yourself, I think is throughout this. Yeah, I don't think that's superficial. I think that's one of those concepts that's, um, that's simple, but very difficult, um, especially if you are, you know, educated and driven and, um, you know, some, some of the very characteristics that may have put you where you are in the world are also um, characteristics that don't let you leave yourself alone um, and drain enormous amounts of energy. Um, because, you know, like if you're beating yourself up in the car, by the time you get to that meeting, you may have kind of drained, you may have sort of drained a lot of your energy that could have been used for love. Uh, for those other people. And if you had just been kinder to yourself and said, oh, wow, look, there, there's my addiction. There's my, my being late addiction, like just flaring up. Like, that's just who I am. It's one of my wounds that I carry. Um, and here I'm spinning some larger story about how that's, I'm, that's such a problem and I'm such a problem. And if you can kind of just be present to that in a kind way, um, 
it 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 won't it it won't have nearly as much power. It'll fade away, uh, and it won't take nearly as much energy uh, from you. Thank you. Right. That was wonderful. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Really good to be with you. And um, oh, my my wife gave me a heart. Um, all right, so. Yeah, um, if you would like the presentation, email me um, or you know, anything else related to the authors, but go in peace and have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank, right, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. You're welcome. Thank you.